Hello, everyone. The Department of Local Government Finance wanted to put together a webinar, kind of a demoing, how to fill out the new and updated sales disclosure form that will be available starting 1-1-21 of the upcoming year. Now, the instructions document was released by the department last week, and hopefully the new layout of the instructions make it a little clearer as to what information should be included in each of the fields. And we're going to kind of go along the instructions document as we look at the updated sales disclosure form. I'm joined today with Barry Wood, our assessment division director. And before we kind of get into some of the specifics, Barry, do you want to go ahead and give everybody uh, any additional thoughts or notes before we jump in? Um, no other than Emily Chrysler, our general counsel, is the other voice you hear doing this presentation. <laughs> Thank you, Barry. Um, so the sales disclosure form is meant to be included for any kind of property transaction where it's a, considered a conveyance document is at issue. This is any kind of valuable consideration that has been provided in exchange for property. There is an enumerated list and the instruction document kind of includes what those different documentation items are that would include a property conveyance. It's a, a document or a land deed, a contract of sale, an agreement, a judgment from a court, a lease that includes a fee simple estate that's for a period in excess of 90 years, a quick claim deed that serves as a source of title, and any document that's presented for recording that purports to transfer real property. So those are the kind of conveyance documents that this document will primarily relate to. It also can be used for purposes of a mandatory uh, conveyance of property with a court order, which could be a foreclosure, divorce, probate matters, uh, condemnation, judgment, and so these things will also be further addressed in the form. Now, at the top of the form with the instructions, you'll note that the same kind of privacy notice is still included. Telephone numbers and the social security numbers of any party that is filling out this form are confidential in accordance with 61.15.5.3. And the information that is included on this form that are considered confidential will not be made publicly available. Now, on the sales disclosure portal that's offered through the Department of Local Government Finance, these pieces of information will not be generated in the PDF that is produced. New to the revised sales disclosure form is the note section. It talks about which of those fields would be considered something that could be the basis for rejecting the submission of a sales disclosure form. All italicized fields are very important for the assessors to consider when it comes to property conveyances. However, the italicized fields, if there's a failure to produce the information for those, it should not result in the rejection of the underlying conveyance document. That being said, all mm -hmm. boxes that can be filled out by the preparer should be. If the question doesn't apply and you're able to put not applicable in that box, you may do so. If the question has a yes or no box and the preparer is unsure or does not know how to complete that box, a no is appropriate for those situations. Going to the part one of the form, a lot of this information is very similar to what was on the previous version of the sales disclosure form. The first box is meant to include the parcel number or the tax identification mm -hmm. number of the property at issue. This will primarily be the 18 digit parcel number from the state identified uh, property tax identification system. Numbers two through four are to be checked if they're applicable to the parcel. If it's a split parcel, if it's land only or includes an improvement complete address of the property would just be the location of the property at issue. Six, if there's a different tax billing address, the address that property tax bills would go to would be included in that box. And box seven is for the legal description of the parcel. At times we've uh, had questions or concerns about whether or not this box is large enough to include the entire legal description of the parcel. If it is not, it can be something that is included on an attachment that is provided with the sales disclosure form. Now at the top on the instruction section, it says that this must relate to um, everything that is being conveyed in a single transactional document. Additional contiguous properties that are in addition to the one that would be listed below can be provided on page five. Page five includes additional lines if you have multiple properties that are a part of the same transaction. And then if we go down to part 1B for conditions, I'll let Barry kind of go over some of these fields as they pertain to filling out the sales disclosure form. 
Number one talks about a transfer of real property interest for valuable consideration. What is valuable consideration? It could be a dollar, it could be $10, it could be any amount. So that box would be either marked yes or no if it was for valuable consideration. Number two is the buyer and adjacent property owner. Um, this is important because this could validate or invalidate a sale. Was the sale exposed to the open market? Was the buyer motivated um, to buy the property because he wanted to acquire the adjoining property? Number three, vacant land, no structures on land. Um, this is pretty self-explanatory. Number four, exchange for other real property, quotations a trade. So in other words, did a property owner trade um, in exchange for with another property owner um, various parcels of land? Number five, the land contract. This would have a starting date and an ending date. Typically with the contracts, um, the, the initial sales disclosure, disclosure form will be filed when the property is, the contract is consummated. And depending on the length of the contract, it could be a year, it could be five years, it could be 10 years, but typically a sales disclosure will be filed at the end of the contract term. Number six, partial interest. Was there any partial interest for this property? And please describe what that would be. All these conditions are important because it helps the assessor, the assessing official in determining should this sales disclosure be used in the annual adjustment or trending process. Over to the right side, looking at the, um, the conditions, you know, were there any other conditions such as easements or right-of-ways? You can see that this would include public utility or government governmental easements um, or rights-of-way that do not transfer fee simple um, these do not require a sales disclosure form. And if you need more information, you can see our instructions. And looking at numbers eight through 10, um, if these apply, filers are subject to the file of the disclosure, but not to the disclosure filing fee. And this includes document for compulsory transactions as a result of foreclosure or express threat of foreclosure, divorce, court order, judgment, condemnation, eminent domain, or probate. Documents involving the partition of land between tenants in common, joint tenants or tenants by entirety, or number 10, transferred to a charity, not-for-profit organization, or governmental entity or agency. And then we can move on to part one, section C. These details included in this portion of the first page relate to information that is associated with the overall transaction. Over on the left-hand side, you'll see a number of different conditions that relate to the environment or kind of the circumstances that surrounded the sale. Uh, these pieces of information, you might not have any that do apply, but when these situations do apply, they're very useful for the county to be aware of, whether it's a sheriff or tax sale, a short sale, whether it was transferred as a quick claim deed, either for the purposes of title or not. Now remember, if it's a quick claim deed not serving as the source of title for the property, a sales disclosure form is not required. So if the answer to quick claim deed is yes, but it wasn't serving as a source of title, the form is not required for those transactions. Number four, if the property was conveyed or sold at auction. And then number five is if there was any other circumstances that related to the transaction or the sale of the property. Up on number six, this is a new addition to the form. Now, if the transaction includes multiple sales disclosure forms, this will allow the preparer to select yes, and then reference which number of form this, the one that they're currently filling out is. If I have six different parcels that are a part of a property conveyance, but they are not contiguous, I would need to fill out five different sales disclosure forms. So if this is for the first parcel of that sale, I would put this is sales disclosure form <clears throat> one of five. For number seven, the date the conveyance document is signed, which is typically seen as the date in which the property is actually conveyed. I might add in our instructions, we state the following, provide the date that the conveyance document is signed, the effective date of the deed or document or the date of the most recent signature on the conveyance document. 
This date determines what year the sale may be used for trending purposes, it may also be referred to as the date of the sale. That is correct. Moving on to number eight, you'll see that this is one of the first italicized fields that's on the form. It is not something that if the preparer does not know or is unable to provide that should result in the ultimate denial or rejection of the underlying conveyance document. However, if this information is known by the preparer, it is important to fill this out. This will give additional information to the county office to know what the sale conditions were like and whether or not there was something uh, unique in particular about the sale that is relevant for purposes of ratio studies and the review of sales. Number nine is just an additional summary. If you have additional parcels that are contiguous that can be completed on one sales disclosure form, it should correspond with the information that is both on page one under part A and part the remaining parcels on page five. So if there are six contiguous parcels, there would be one at the beginning of this form on the first page, and then you would have the remaining five on page five. So you would put a total of six. Number 10 specifies that you would select the type of property that relates to the conveyance, and you would check the corresponding boxes and complete the pages. Now, there is the option that you would be able to select more than one box, depending on whether or not the property at issue was a mixed use property. Please note that there are no specific definitions for what is residential, what is commercial, what is industrial, what is agricultural. It is not based on the zoning because zoning, there could be a zoning variance, but it is based on what is the current use of the property. To determine current use of property, it could be based on information that is made available from buyer or seller. Uh, and Barry, could this be something that they refer to potentially the property class code of the parcel at issue? Correct. The, the state, the D Department of Local Government Finance has pro various property class codes for the residential, commercial, agricultural, industrial property classes. And you can find those um, property class codes on our website, www.in.gov forward slash DLGF. So once you've selected one or more boxes that are applicable, you would continue to the next page to fill out the corresponding sections. Again, if it's mixed use and you select more than one box or a box that requires you to fill out sections D all the way through section G, you want to complete all of the corresponding portions on the next page. On page two, starting with sales data, the top two sections of page two relate to residential or agricultural property. At the top of the sales data, you'll also see a box here that can be selected. The information that's contained in question number three has been determined that it could be confidential and non-disclosable under Indiana Code 5-14-3-4. This relates to the planned use of the property in field three. If you do not select this box, it will not be entered into the sales disclosure system as having confidential information. Therefore, if it's not selected, it could be made available and generated upon review and pulling of the sales disclosure form from the database that is hosted by the department. Number two, it asks whether or not there will be changes to the property between January 1 and the sale date. If there will be no changes to the property between that time period, you could select no, and under the described box, you can just put non applicable. If there will be changes, you would select yes and describe or outline the changes to the property between those two dates. For number two, it asks whether the property is a residential rental property. This could apply to whether or not the property in its entirety or a portion of the property is being used as a rental property. Is this correct, Barry? Correct. And for number three, again, it asks for the planned use of the property and asks for any descriptions. What kind of things are we looking for in this field, Barry? As far as planned use of the property, if it's vacant property, that may go towards how does the property be assessed if there's a potential change in the property that would may maybe change the property classification. Um, that could also be something that would be um, useful for the assessing official and or just to know, you know, will continue in its current use as say a residential housing structure will continue as an office building, whatever the situation may be. Looking at the finance data, section E, this is very important for the assessing official, especially as part of the, the annual adjustment process. The sales price should be listed 
in some situations, the it, it may may not be known. It may be an estimate, but it should be accurately reflect what the sale price of that property is was at the, on the sale date. And again, this is used by the assessing official to help estimate the market value and use for comparable properties. If personal property was included in the transfer, that amount, if known, should be included. Again, this helps the assessing official to know, um, say, for example, it was a lake property and there was a boat or jet skis or something like that included in the sale. This would help the assessor know that the sale price included this and maybe they would need to back that out to help determine the assessed value for the real property improvement. Were there any seller paid points or closing costs? This is helpful again for the assessor to know, um, you know what amount of that sale price is attributed to those seller, seller paid points or closing costs. Um, is there an existence of a family or business relationship between the buyer and the seller? Was there an amount of a discount, if any? This helps the assessor to determine, is this a valid sale for trending purposes? Describe any less than complete ownership interest in terms of seller financing. Again, this will help the assessor um, in the in the uh, annual adjustment process. On the right hand side of section E, under the conditions, you'll see number six is the seller financing the sale. If yes, answer question seven through eight through eight. Um, if if you did answer yes, is the buyer borrow personally liable for a loan? Is this a mortgage loan? Was an appraisal done? Um, these are all things that will help the assessor when they're trying to determine the market value and use of the property. And also, should this sale be included in the annual adjustment process? Is it a valid sale or not a valid sale? That determination, by the way, is made by the assessing official. And once again, number nine, you'll see that it's an italicized question, which means that if this information is not known or is not able to be provided for any reason, failure to provide the information along with the sales disclosure form should not result in the rejection of the underlying conveyance documents. Moving on to section F for sales data, it looks identical to what was provided above under the agricultural and residential fields uh, on subsection D. Once again, if the information that's gonna be contained in question three should be considered confidential or non-disclosable, you'll wanna check this box. Failure to check this box means that the information may be produced when the PDF from the sales disclosure database is generated. Once again on one, it's to describe the changes to the property between January 1 and the sale date and any description of the change to the property. Number two, the property residential rental property. Again, yes or no, whether it's in part or in whole. And then number three is the planned use of the property and you would provide it a corresponding description. Looking at the finance data, as you can see the box that says information contained in questions two through 12 is confidential and non-disclosable under the Indiana Code citations you see there. Number one asks for the sales price, the amount. And then looking at conditions number two through eight on the left-hand side, it talks about the sale price included in an existing business. The italicized number three sale price included a liquor license. This may or may not be known. It's if not known, it's not required to be checked. Number four, it's also, all these are italicized. Transaction was part of a portfolio sale. Any part of the property was leased at the time of the sale. And sale included property receiving an abatement. An appraisal was completed for the sale. If so, what was the appraisal amount? That may or may not be known. Um, and number eight, the sale included property in a tax increment finance or a TIF district. All these, in, all these characteristics, characteristics, conditions, again, help the assessing official to determine what, if any of these valid, any of these sales are valid for trending purposes. On the right hand side of section G, you'll see how is number nine, how is the sale financed? Check any, any that apply, was it all cash? Seller financing, construction loan, mortgage loan, a sale leaseback, or a small business loan. Number 10 is italicized. You may or may not know this. It's not, not required if you do not know, but how is the property marketed by word of mouth? List with the broker for sale sign, buyer approached. Number 11 talks about special circumstances. 
And were there, was there a sale between the same business entity, sale in lieu of foreclosure, sold at auction, trade of equipment or services, sale of, sale of partial interest? Again, this all goes back to the assessor and can they use a sale in the annual adjustment process? Much like we discussed in, number, in the residential side, number 12 talks about value of personal property included. Do you know how much, if any, was included? And for some assessing officials, the best way to do this is to verify um, with the seller. And the seller is typically gonna be more um, forthcoming or willing to divulge the information than the buyer may be. Finally, number 13 talks about value of intangible personal property included. And tangible property could include um, naming rights, um, goodwill, things like that. Uh, it can also include things like patents, copyrights, investments, and any partnership interest. Just as it's described, it's a personal property interest that's not tangible. It's not something we can see, but it has some kind of value attached to it. That would be something that's contemplated in field 13. Then moving on to page three, you see information for the preparer and the seller and or grantor of the property. Under section H for the preparer, you're gonna list name, title, and company including email address, telephone number, and address. For the seller or grantor, if there's more than one, you can provide the corresponding information uh, for one and for two. Now the fields that are here should be able to accommodate both email addresses of a certain character length as well as international or local telephone numbers. Right here, you're gonna have the, the um, signature box for the seller and the printed name. If there's only one seller, only one side would need to be completed. If you do have a conveyance that includes more than one seller and more than one buyer, technically under statute, you only need to have one seller and one buyer complete the form. Section J, once again, similar to above for the seller, you have enough information, and enough room to include two buyers if there are two. You'll include name as it appears on the conveyance document, address, city, state, zip code, country, email address, and telephone number. And again, these fields should be large enough to accommodate any international telephone numbers. Below the information for the buyer, seller, and preparer, you'll find the sections here, which relate to any of the tax incentives and deductions that an individual can use the sales disclosure form to apply for. Now, if there is a individual that comes in and wants to use the sales disclosure form for purposes of just filing a deduction, unfortunately, they cannot be used for that purpose. It can only be used if any of the deductions that are listed here on the right-hand side or wanting to be claimed by somebody that is a part of the conveyance that the underlying sales disclosure form relates to. On number one, the question is, will the property be the buyer's primary residence? If the individual wants to apply for the homestead deduction after they have completed the transaction, they would want to select yes. And for number two, does the buyer have a homestead that needs to be vacated for their previous residence? They want to claim one and they did have a homestead deduction on their current and to be vacated property, they would want to select yes and provide the corresponding address information below. In addition to the homestead deduction, an individual can use this to apply for the solar energy heating or cooling system deduction, the wind power device deduction, the hydroelectric power device, or the geothermal energy heating or cooling device. Now with four through seven, there could be corresponding documentation that needs to be provided with this form that would be provided from IDEM. Barry, were there any other thoughts? Yes, please note that this the sales disclosure form is not used for the mortgage deduction. That is specifically excluded from one of those conditions that could be applied for a deduction. And that's correct. And the number of the deductions that are listed over on the right-hand side in three through seven are on, the only deductions that have been enumerated in statute that can be used or claimed on the sales disclosure form. Any others? that are not included are because they are not allowed by statute. Below the deduction or tax incentive section, you'll see the final signature line of the buyer with a printed legal name, this bottom box that refers to the last five digits of buyer one, including a sales or social security number, driver's license, ID, or other number. This box and these pieces of information only have to be provided if the buyer is using the sales disclosure form to apply for the homestead deduction. If they are using the sales disclosure form to apply for the homestead deduction, the first thing to go to would be the last five digits of their social security number. If the buyer or the buyer's spouse does not have a social security number, 
then it would be the last five digits of a driver's license, a state issued ID, or a federal issued ID. And I believe the corresponding pages uh, that we've just gone through relate to all the information that a preparer would need to fill out, aside from that page five where you would provide any additional contiguous parcels that are a part of the conveyance. I think that wraps up the base part of the form. Barry, did you have any closing thoughts for everyone? No, I think you've covered it very well. All right. Well, thank you everybody so much for taking a time to uh, listen to this demo. If there are any other questions that you have regarding how to complete and fill out the sales disclosure form, please feel free to reach out to the department. We do have a section of our website that is dedicated to including not only the frequently asked questions, our past presentation, outlining the changes as well as the instructions and the file specifications that correspond with the sales disclosure form. We hope everybody uh, has a good, safe holiday and that everybody enjoys using this hopefully more organized form going forward. Thank you. Bye.